My name is Karen Greenberg, and on behalf of New America and the Center on National Security at Fordham Law, I am really delighted to be here today to host this panel. We are convening to celebrate the publication of a brand new book, The Rutledge Handbook of U.S. Counterterrorism and Irregular Warfare Operations, a compendium of 34 chapters by 47 contributors, edited by Liam Collins, who's with us today, Eric Marquand, and Michael Sheehan. And before I introduce today's stellar panel, a few words are in order about Michael Sheehan, who is a friend and colleague of many of us here today. This book was his idea, his cherished project for many years, and he treated it like the legacy he knew it would be. It's designed to educate and inform students, scholars, practitioners, and policymakers for decades to come. And it is a reflection of the mixture of talents, knowledge, and wherewithal that Mike embodied. To remind you, Mike was ambassador at large at the State Department as the coordinator for counterterrorism. He was assistant secretary general of the UN directly in charge of peacekeeping operations after 9-11. He was deputy commissioner for counterterrorism at the NYPD. And then beginning in 2011, he was assistant secretary of defense for special operations and low intensity conflict at the Pentagon. In other words, he worked in local, national and international arenas across the military, the State Department, the UN, and law enforcement. And all of this is reflected in the historical and geographical breadth of this book, a true reflection of Mike's life work, which takes us from counterinsurgency operations in Latin America to the war in Iraq, from the NYPD to horse soldiers in Afghanistan, from drone warfare to information warfare. Our hope today is to focus on a few of the essays included in the book and have a discussion about Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan. And we might, if we have time, turn to the lessons this book might hold for the war in Ukraine. So let's get started. Let's turn to our panel. With us today to discuss this are four of the leading scholars on Al Qaeda, ISIS, the war on terror, and the region. First, my longtime colleague, Peter Bergen, Vice President for Global Studies and fellows at, Fellow at New America, the author of numerous books about the war on terror, Al-Qaeda and bin Laden, and most recently, The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden, which I highly recommend. Also with us today is Liam Collins, one of the editors of the book who worked tirelessly to make sure its publication came about and did a truly wonderful job, along with his colleague, Eric Marquand. A retired army colonel with special forces, Liam was formerly director of the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point and the founding director of the Modern War Institute. Liam is now the executive director of the Viola Foundation and a fellow with New America's International Security Program. Also with us today is Elizabeth Kendall, who joins us from the UK where she is the senior research fellow in Arabic and Islam at Pembroke College, Oxford University. Elizabeth is also the chairman of a grassroots NGO in Yemen and the former director of a UK government sponsored center aimed at developing Arabic based research expertise. Elizabeth is the author of numerous books and articles, most recently Diplomacy Arabic. With us also is Luke Hartig, a fellow with New America's International Security Program. He previously served as senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council and has served in a variety of positions across the executive branch. He is president of National Journal of Research. He is the author of numerous articles on the Just Security blog, most recently a wonderful article on the Pentagon's current drone policy. So Peter, let's get started with you. You've spent an awful lot of time thinking and writing about war, asymmetric warfare in the wake of 9-11, hybrid war, and the generals and policymakers that have addressed the threat of international terrorism. Your essay in this book, written with A.G. Sims, American Drone Wars Outside of Conventional War Zones, focuses on one of the pieces of the counterterrorism framework, drones, but within the context of expanding geographical areas in the war on terror. So Peter, let me ask you a big picture question. Can you set the stage for us? I know Ukraine is front and center day, but terrorism and insurgencies continue spiking and receding every week. Can you give us an overview of how far the lessons of these new forms of warfare have brought us and where you see today's most pronounced challenges to counter terrorism activities? In five to seven minutes, um, <laughs> good luck. So, I mean, Look, if Mike Sheehan was alive today, I think he'd be tearing his hair out uh, about the <clears throat> the fact that the Taliban have taken over Afghanistan. I mean, Mike, you know, even before 9-11, Ambassador Sheehan well understood the threat posed by the Taliban. He, you know, he actually spoke with the foreign minister, Mudawakil, in the <clears throat> about a year before 9-11, essentially saying the following, which is, you know, 
if something happens that's traceable to Afghanistan, we are going to ho hold you accountable. And he used a metaphor that he hoped would get through to Muduwa Kill, which is if you have somebody staying in your basement and they come out and they set fire to your neighbor's house, you're accountable for the behavior of the person that's in your basement. Um, so Ambassador Sheehan, I think, would be very disappointed about what I think the big development is in the world of jihadism, which is the Taliban taker of, 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 of Afghanistan. And, um, you know, that certainly wasn't predictable a few, even two years ago. I mean, uh, a year ago, the Taliban controlled none of the 34 provincial capitals of Afghanistan, and now they control all of them. And the, there was a certain kind of group of people who had, uh, uh, I think, very much of wishful thinking about the Taliban. Um, you know, I didn't think uh, Ambassador Sheehan shared uh, that wishful thinking. Um, and anybody who's had any experience of dealing with them uh, didn't share that uh, wishful thinking. Uh, but it was pretty powerful. And the United States signed a, a peace agreement with the Taliban, which essentially gave them everything with giving up nothing. Uh, they gave up, gave up nothing. And I don't think it's an accident, by the way, that Putin moved 90,000 troops to the border of Ukraine exactly two months after the, the, the final US withdrawal. Um, getting inside Putin's mind is not easy, uh, but I think that's a pretty high level of coincidence. So clearly, obviously, he's been planning this for a long time, but this uh, seemed to signal American weakness and American withdrawal from the world. And of course, uh, <clears throat> Putin vastly miscalculated the US and NATO response. Uh, but I think one of the kind of really interesting questions about the Taliban now with Siraj Akhani being the defense, uh, the Minister of Interior, which is equivalent, the American equivalent of running the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, is you have this very unusual thing where a kidnapping group, a crime syndicate, a terrorist group, now controls the government. And you know, there's, this is unprecedented in my, I think. 17 of the 33 cabinet picks in the first round of cabinet picks uh, by the Taliban, 17 of those 33 are UN designated designated by the UN in some shape or form uh, uh, and sanctioned. I don't, there's not a government in the world, maybe now the Russians are, <laughs> but until that point, um, you know, this, this is unprecedented. So, and I, I want to zero in on a particular case, I think is, uh, you know, uh, Luke Hartig did a lot, has done a, a, a huge amount of work in this area, but we now have, you know, it used to be a concern, a big concern of the US government was Americans being taken hostages by groups like the Taliban. Um, and we still have Mark Frerichs, who was taken by the Taliban uh, two years ago, over two years ago, an American contractor taken by the Akhani network at a time when they were a terrorist insurgent group. Now that they de facto government. And so we're in a very awkward position, I think, in, in the, the discussions we're having with the Taliban. They have detained an old friend of mine, Peter Juvenal. Uh, he's known to many who cover Afghanistan, who ran, who, uh, ran and, and owned the Gandamak Lodge Hotel. Peter has been reporting on Afghanistan since 1980. He went in 75 times during the Russian occupation at great personal risk. He's married to an Afghan, he speaks both languages. He's done a lot for Afghanistan. He's employed a lot of Afghans in his various businesses. He's been detained by the Taliban. So is an American citizen, so is an American legal resident. And uh, uh, one of those American legal residents is also a British citizen. And, and there are another five British citizens, all of them have been, been held. They've now been held for three months. They were almost all taken in mid-December. And what do we do about this um, is, is an interesting question uh, because you're, you're dealing with essentially this, this terrorist insurgent group that now is a de facto government. And you know, if it was a, a, re, a real government that was recognized, there might be, you know, we're more used to dealing with that. And right now we're in a very uncomfortable dilemma about how to, you know, how to negotiate with the Taliban when we don't recognize them and the UN has sanctioned so many of them. One other, one other point, uh, just to, 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 since you mentioned drones, Karen, I want to say that Ambassador Sheehan was, you know, along with Dick Clark before 9-11, was instrumental in getting the drone program sort of moved forward. You, you may recall that there was a dispute between the Pentagon and the CIA about who would pay for the drones, a dispute that seems kind of absurd now. Uh, but it was uh, bureaucratically, it was hard to do. Uh, and, and Mike Sheehan and, and, and Dick Clark were pushing for this. And you know, I think the drone program in a lot of ways has been very successful. And don't take my word for it, take Osama bin Laden's word for it. If you look at the documents in the Abbottabad compound, again and again, he returns to the dangers posed by the drone program and the dangers it poses to his organization, such that he was even planning to move Al Qaeda uh, 
out of the federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan, uh, deeper into Pakistan, back into Afghanistan, maybe to Iran. He didn't know, but he was very concerned about it. Um, and so this program, which obviously, you know, there's issues around civilian casualties, which are certainly a concern, although those have gone down significantly over time. And the program itself has been more or less suspended entirely by the Biden administration, with the exception of a, a, a drone, a recent drone strike in Somalia that was actually, AFRICOM actually officially admitted to it uh, because of because of an inquiry by David Sturman of New America. Um, but the, so in terms of the, you know, the book that Mike and, and Liam and Eric edited, uh, my, my particular part of it was, was the drone program, which I think you know, owes its genesis to people like Dick Clark and, and Mike Sheehan. And you know, in terms of the damage it did to Al Qaeda was highly effective, according to bin Laden himself. Liam warned me about that. Let me just follow up with one with one question, which is that when we're thinking about irregular warfare, hybrid warfare, one thing that doesn't get mentioned often is kidnapping. Would you hostage taking? Would yeah. you include that in the? I mean, I've noticed a, a number of articles recently have actually talked about this in light of the current conflict. Should, isn't is that part of it that I think people don't usually uh, address? I mean, I think that's a very good question. I mean, Luke is in a better position to, even, to talk about it than I am. But I mean, you know, one, we used to be concerned about terrorist groups taking hostages, which is still a concern. But now we have states using yeah. this as a tool of war, sort of, you know, strategic warfare against their adversaries, whether it's Iranians or the Russians uh, and now the Taliban. Um, and, you know, it's it it actually poses interesting problems for the U.S. government um kind of apparatus which was largely focused on correctly on the isis terrorist uh, hostage taking problem but now we need to th also think about how do you deal with states who are using this as a, a tool of statecraft um in in many you know in many cases and you've got two americans right now in russia uh paul well and and uh and trevor reed i think uh amongst many others you know that that are that are a real concern thank you Elizabeth, let's turn to you. Um, your, your piece in this book is Jihad Militancy and Houthi Insurgency in Yemen. And it's just a terrific overview of the rise of the Houthis in Yemen. Um, and the con in the context of the history of Yemen, I just have to say you do an awful lot and very you know, concise amount of, of pages. So thank you for that. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, one of the things you touch on in your chapter is the way in which, and I'm quoting, counterterrorism has become a convenient justification for all sides in the ongoing battles. And I just wondered if you could just sort of expand on this a little bit, both in the context of Yemen and perhaps elsewhere if you want to, because what does that really mean if a term gets you know, used so much that it no longer has the, um, you know, the accuracy and the definitional quality that it once had. Just can you talk about that? And then I'm gonna turn a little bit to communication. Right, well, what I meant by that is that counterterrorism has become a, a carte blanche, a, a get out of jail free card for all sorts of actors in the war in Yemen. Because when you're trying to um, score political points against your enemies, you obviously have the unbelievably strong excuse that your enemies also happen to be terrorists. So that's the first thing. So, for example, um, the Houthis in their recent expansions into central Yemen have been able to position themselves to frame themselves as a counterterrorism partner by claiming that their expansionist ambitions across Yemen are actually a counterterrorism operation. Um, and, you know, there may be some elements of truth to that in the sense that as the Houthis have expanded, groups like Al Qaeda and the Islamic State have either disappeared or fallen back or gone to other areas. But of course, there's definitely a question here about how much that's been done in coordination with the Houthis rather than as a direct result of uh, being combated by the Houthis. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is that it's very convenient to false flag operations, politically motivated operations to terrorist groups. So when you are, for example, fighting the uh, Southern separatists down in and around Aden, well, you can claim that that isn't actually 
Houthis or you, um, the Saudi bit of the coalition fighting them, you can claim that that is in fact Al Qaeda doing it. Um, now, I'm not making any hard and fast judgments here, I hasten to add, but what I'm saying is that it's really difficult to figure out what's going on now because terrorism has become such a woolly concept. And even the labels Al Qaeda and Islamic State have become really quite opaque, much more difficult and more blurred to define than they were uh, five or six years ago at the start of the war. And do you have a uh, policy solution or a legal solution or a diplomatic solution to that? Or is it just something um, you think we have to sort of just think harder about how we how we label things? Or is there some prescriptive you have in mind? Well, yeah, of course, it's much easier to talk about the problems than figure out the solutions, right? But um, I think there are a, a couple of things that we could be thinking about more clearly. Um, first of all, identifying the fake news, if you like. This has become so much more difficult. Year by year, it's become more difficult. Even some of the guys I uh, kitted out with cameras and one of my trips to Yemen a few years ago, even some of these guys have now been co-opted by other actors in the war to start churning out something that looks like citizen journalism, but really isn't. Um, you know, I've been myself in, in the middle court in demonstrations, which were for one thing, but were then projected on local TV stations as being for something else. And, and you would never know, these look like primary sources. Um, but but if, if you weren't there, you wouldn't realize that they'd been mislabeled or a few extra flags had been put on in people's hands to make it look like they were, for example, in support of uh, Southern separatists, whereas in fact, they're in support of Eastern independence, that kind of thing. So what we could do, um, well, maybe three things. I, I guess the first thing is a lot more human intelligence, real people mm -hmm. things on the ground in person. Uh, I know that that's complicated, but nothing beats it because you're you know, people you can trust looking at things firsthand and who know what they're doing. So that would be the second thing. So really, you, you need to be au fait with the source languages, even when you're looking at it from a distance, like, you know, the study where I'm sitting uh, in London at the moment. You know, if you you have to be reading the original Arabic sources really to to figure out, are they using the same words in their statements that they were using last year? Or is this now being faked by a group pretending to be Al-Qaeda or the Houthis? Or have they evolved? Um, and so that then leads us on to the third thing, which is a very deep cultural historical knowledge. Um, something that where you can be tipped off by, by different clues and the style and in, in, in who's speaking and how they're speaking and the kinds of references they're using as to how authentic something is. And that's not something that you can do just by being sent on a, a crash course to, you know, by the foreign office to Cairo for six months to learn some Egyptian Arabic and then hope you're going to be able to get by somewhere like Yemen or, or North Africa or Iraq. You know, this is this requires strong investment and, and a big time commitment. I think that would be helpful. You know, I um, I just wonder if just one more thing, which is that we've been hearing that since 9-11, that, you know, we need a deeper understanding of, 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 of these cultures. We need a deeper understanding on the ground. We need, so my question to you is not have we solved it, which I, I get the answer, but have, have we gotten better at it? Or did we never really do the homework we needed to do to be able to immerse ourselves and, and share information and understand what's going on in the way we need to. How, how do you see the curve of this, the direction? Well, I, I think we're still, and you know, perhaps rightly, I, I, who's to sit in judgment, but in terms of the outcomes we want, not rightly, but we're still very risk averse. Um, it gets difficult, you sort of pull out, pull out all your embassy folk, but even when, even before we pull out our embassy folk, it's a hardship post, so you're, you're in there for, I don't know, six months, you're quickly out again, in, out. And, and also there's a massive turnover, not just in diplomatic personnel, but in the military as well, where there's an automatic career progression. So as soon as you start peeling off the layers of a really tricky place, 
you know, you're, you're moving on to the next place. So mm -hmm. I'm not so sure we we might be saying the same things again and again, but I, I'm not convinced that we're really learning the lessons. And and even I mean, I remember being in Sanaa when we still had an embassy there and, and visiting our um, visiting colleagues, you know, actually getting out and figuring out what's going on is quite different from being in your your guarded convoy, your four by four and doing a circle between the US embassy, the UN, and then back to the UK embassy and et cetera. How are you ever gonna know? And also relying too much on regional allies because you think, well, they're, they're in the region, so Arabic speakers, um, they must know what they're doing. But perhaps they're also relying on the same old elites that they've been relying on for years. Uh, so I, I just think we need to be a bit sharper. Thank you. Luke, let's turn to you. Um, your chapter on US counterterrorism policy in Yemen from 2010 to 2020, it's an app partner to Elizabeth's. Um, and it has this wonderful chronology of sort of the rise and fall of the US engagement there, particularly, but not only with, with drone strikes that Peter was uh, referencing. But you have this list of five core policy imperatives <clears throat> that defined US intentions in Yemen. And one of them, I just want to focus on, if you don't mind, which is the imperative of avoiding overcommitment. Um, and I'm just wondering where, how you see this now? You know, have, have we successfully avoided overcommitment? Have we overly avoided overcommitment? And where do you see our appetite for commitment these days? And I, if you feel like thinking beyond Yemen, feel free. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Appreciate the question. And you know, just briefly, I mean, it, it, I wanted to say again what an amazing guy Mike Sheehan was, and how fortunate I felt to have him as a boss mentor. And I think one of the great things about working with Mike, and I think it's actually really well reflected in this volume, <clears throat> is for a guy who studied insurgency for a living, he kind of ran his policy operations like it was an insurgency. You know, he put together these kind of small band of misfits. I mean, I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer. I have no idea what I was doing um, on his team, former military officers, others. Um, and, you know, pushing for Mike some really big and revolutionary and, and not the stiff, boring stuff you typically get in bureaucracy, but entrepreneurial ideas and pushing that through. And I think, I think that just comes through so well um, in this handbook. I remember some of the edits Mike gave me during the process. They were combative uh, in the best of ways, um, really pushing me to think hard uh, to create an excellent product, but also just because he enjoyed that process. So it's really an honor to be uh, part of this. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. But you know, to your specific question, Karen, yeah, I mean, I think that 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 dynamic of avoiding overcommitment, and what I was getting at there was was there was a time in during the Obama administration when we talked about the Yemen model, and the Yemen model was a really good thing, right? It was a small footprint, some limited drone strikes, some military assistance, and some civilian assistance that was ostensibly going to take the country into a better place. And for several years, it looked like that's exactly where we were going. You know, looking at it now, both reading the words that I wrote a couple of years ago and and looking at what's happened in the war in the, the years since, it's hard to look at it as anything but like a pretty complex and, and utter failure. Um, I think the I think the overcommitment point um, gets at you know we never did bring in the kind of civilian assistance that we wanted to both because we didn't want to overcommit but also because we were very risk averse um, after Benghazi um, that included civilian experts that also included military experts again something that Mike Sheehan was always pushing for he always wanted to get more military trainers and more um, more assistance to uh, to the local forces um, and it meant that we never had that right posture in there to actually be able to do the things we want to do. So there's one like, right, do we even have the right, right tools in place? And there's a second question of, do we even have the right judgment um, to make it to get, get achieve the outcomes we wanted to achieve? And I think a lot of this gets at, at Elizabeth's point about just how poorly we misunderstood the Yemeni political climate um, and, uh, and how poorly we understood how um, some of the reforms that we were pushing, whether that was, you know, removing the loyalists to former President Saleh and to Ali Musin from the security services, um, the dynamics of the Houthis, the failure of imagination to Im imagine that the Houthis and the Saleh might actually come together around a shared objective, 
all of that kind of blew up in our face. And, and one of the, the, the dynamics and the specific events that I talked about in my chapter was so critical of that was, was our efforts to push the IMF's um, fiscal reforms uh, in Yemen, ultimately meaning that, or the most important one being um, the revocation of the, um, of the fuel subsidies. Um, and that was sort of the, the final match that lit the fire, right? And that was the pretext that the Houthis used was outrage. And there was legitimate outrage about um, sudden rising fuel prices in Yemen. Um, even if it was a good ultimate fiscal policy thing, it was a, there was a lot of concerns about that. Um, and the Houthis seized on that to seize power. And I think we missed so many details like that um, that ultimately led to, uh, to the, the overthrow of the Hadi government and, um, and the rise of the Houthis. We did some stuff well, right? Um, Peter talked about the direct action program. The direct action program definitely removed a lot of top Al Qaeda leaders, um, definitely made an impact on the threat both within Yemen as well as abroad. Um, where we failed there, and I think where you see us failing on direct action consistently over the last you know, 20 years, is just an utter lack of transparency around it um, and a real unwillingness to engage effectively around allegations of civilian casualties. And so no matter how effective our drone strike campaign was in Yemen, you look at things like, you know, the, the strike that was reported to have taken place in December of 2013, where claimed to have hit a wedding party and, um, and the US just never addressed that. And there's never been a public statement made on that, um, on that particular um, uh, reported operation. Uh, and things like that ultimately really kill your credibility and any chance you have to say that we're, we're fighting the good fight. Um, I think that just, that credibility sort of goes up in smoke. So um, I'll pause there. I know I answered a little bit of your question and then a little bit, uh, a little bit more. No, that was great. I have one follow-up question, which is can you expand, expand a little bit on what you mean by civilian assistance? What would that look like? What, what, what is that? Yeah, I mean, at several points, we talked about doing things like doing a pretty robust police and rule of law training program where the State Department would have funded a substantial amount of civilian trainers, both contract trainers, as well as kind of career State Department and USAID or uh, Department of Justice type employees to come in and really help the Yemenis build, um, build that up. Um, there were other, other aid programs that we were looking at, civilian aid, counterviolent extremism type programs, things that ultimately we just couldn't do because we had a very strict cap on the number of people that we could have in Yemen that was driven by, in some cases, the ability to secure the facilities that they were staying in, um, in other cases, just a real risk aversion after Benghazi, where we were doing you know, weekly um, secure video teleconferences where we were viewing threats from around the world. So we never, we never got that aid in there. We never had a robust civilian assistance program. We put some money into Yemen, but we didn't have the kinds of personnel and expertise that we need to really build capacity within, uh, within the Yemeni government um, for things like governance and rule of law. However, I worry that sometimes in one of the critiques I've gotten um, in talking to some friends about, about this chapter uh, is that, you know, I sort of, I've, I've attempted at times to treat this like a technical problem. If only we could have gotten more civilian assistance in place, we would have done better. But I think there's, again, back to my point about the Yemeni political dynamics, there's a real savvy and understanding of Yemeni political dynamics that we just totally missed. I mean, we, or we got it in half measures. Um, it's everything that Elizabeth was saying just a couple minutes ago that we didn't get right. And, and I think when we're looking forward, when we're looking at places where we're going to have to probably engage in, in negotiate with some, you know, some uh, less than ideal partners, or in cases where we're going to have to negotiate with some real out and out adversaries, thinking of like Al-Shabaab and Somalia, where there's been this, there's been increasing calls for negotiations with them. We got to, we got to up our diplomatic game a lot. And that means really developing the types of expertise we need to be able to engage in that. Uh, and then in developing some really smart and, and creative uh, approaches to, uh, to those negotiations. Thank you. Liam, um, you've been writing and thinking about counterterrorism and counterinsurgency for um, many decades now, uh, both on the ground and from afar. You have two chapters in this book, one on Special Operations Forces, uh, Special Operations Command with Charles Cleveland, and another one on dismantling Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Peter and Elizabeth and Luke have kind of given us a rather negative um, assessment of what's gone on and what continues to go on in region. Would you um, disagree with that? And I'm just curious on your, how you weigh the effectiveness of what the United States has tried to do militarily um, with its intelligence forces and diplomatically and, and where you think we are now given all of these years. 
Yeah, so first I want to follow up on something uh, Elizabeth and Luke both said. They talked about being risk risk averse, which I agree, but I take a little more nuanced approach to it. I think we're short-term risk averse, which actually means we're long-term risk seeking without knowing it, right? We aren't assuming that risk in the short term, putting people at these embassies or whatever it is, getting them out where they can actually gather this information and then long-term it, right? So we're long-term risk seeking and don't realize it. Um, yeah, so where we're at, I mean, so, you know, I'll talk about, you know, hit, hit Afghanistan a little bit, because I think it's relevant. We've been talking about that and kind of have some similarities to, to, to Syria and Yemen or, or compare and contrast those. But one of the themes that emerges from the book and looking at an examination of U.S. irregular warfare operations is somewhat ironically or counterintuitively, we find that we're more likely to have success when people don't care about it, right, or when we self-limit our investment to it. When we invest too much in it, we almost doom ourselves to failure, right? Uh, Plan Columbia, right, was a fraction of what the U.S. investment was in Afghanistan, Iraq, and at least in, right, in terms of a counterinsurgency, not necessarily a counter drug, but widely viewed as a, a fairly successful at about a $10 billion initial cost versus one or two trillion in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and the same thing, right, there was a force cap, unintentional force cap of only 55 for operations in El Salvador. And that's widely viewed as a successful counterinsurgency campaign. Um, and they were forced to deploy as trainers and advisors. They couldn't engage in frontline combat. Um, the military didn't even care about the operation, right? And, and if the military cared about it, then they would have screwed it up, right? So who was left running it? Primarily 7th Special Forces Group. And so they could kind of call their own placements forward and switch them out, right? If the military got involved, right, they would make a combat patch for it. It would be a named operation. It, somebody would think it, they need it for promotion and they would start cycling folks in that were completely unqualified for the mission just to get them the experience down there so they could they could do that. And, and so I think that's kind of the case that you see uh, throughout. And, and kind of related to that is um, another theme that emerges is right, you know, we've all heard this, but yet we continue to do it, right? Don't mirror image when we build a US, you know, don't mirror image their political or military institution in the US's image, right? understand their culture, you know, their history to create right, political and military institutions that fit what they are. And, and in Afghanistan, right, we focused on building a national army, which never made any sense, right? The most success we had were kind of the village stability operations, Afghan local police, but we started that too late and didn't, and didn't engage in that process long enough. And kind of, if you look historically, what does the U.S. do fairly well, right? When another country has decided to put their political will to it, and their budget into building a military, we're really good at building a military for them. When a country doesn't have the will or budget to it, we're really good at building kind of a niche force that we can isolate from the corrupt, non-functional, problematic military. And we did that in Afghanistan, and we did that in Iraq with smaller, you know, smaller forces. But we're not good at building a military to scale when there's no national commitment. And no one's good at doing that. Um, and yet that was what we really did in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so it should be no surprise that, right, the Iraqi military folded against, right, the Islamic State, really not, we're not talking the Russian horde coming across the border, and, and the Afghan military in, in, against the Taliban in Afghanistan, right? These are not sophisticated, well-armed enemy, and yet they folded, right? By contrast, right, Colombia, El Salvador are, are, were widely successful. Uh, and so I kind of, you know, we all heard the saying that all politics is, is local. Well, I have a corollary to that, and that's all security is local. And in Afghanistan and Iraq, I think we kind of forgot that. Uh, and then kind of a third, a third kind of theme along that lines, right, kind of mentioned this is anytime, if we're doing an irregular warfare supporting these kind of operations, we often do better if we, if we prevent our forces from engaging in combat. Right, because what happens if, if they engage in combat, right, we can't help ourselves, right, then we want to lead the operations, we aren't so worried about building the local force. Well, right, again, the village stability operation, if you only have a six or a 12 person uh, special forces detachment, you have to rely on the locals for security, as opposed to just running around and hitting targets on your own. Um, in the same, right, in El Salvador was the same case. Um, and again, in Iraq, we didn't, we had the same problem, right? Special forces detachments wanted to go and, and do direct action when that wasn't their, wasn't their role for that. Um, and then, uh, you know, following up what Luke said, I think Luke was talking about overcommitment. And I think, I think, I mean, it's technically, I think the right term, but I think really what we mean is not an overinvestment, right? We have to be committed, right? We have to be committed to Yemen. Otherwise, why are we even there? So commitment isn't the problem. Well, it is a problem. We aren't always committed, but we should be committed, but we can't overinvest. And, and that's, I think that we should think of it that way. 
Let me just follow up with this. You know, one of the things you're really talking about is reacting to things that are going on in country, right? But then there's also the counterterrorism mission of preventive uh, counterterrorism. And what, I was going through a bunch of Mike's old stuff and getting ready for this. And he had given this interview to Harper's, I don't know, like 14 years ago. Here's what he said. The biggest challenge now is to prevent Al Qaeda from exporting its local terrorist capacity capability from Pakistan and Iraq to other parts of the world. And so we've seen, you know, terrorist groups sometimes identifying with Al Qaeda. I mean, to Elizabeth's point, what does it even mean Al Qaeda anymore as a but as a brand and just sometimes with ISIS? And how do you assess this in terms of our successes in countering the development of of of, of terrorism globally, and um, and what more could we do in this respect, or is it something we should focus elsewhere instead? I mean, I, it's it's obviously it's a challenge to try to prevent the spread or or those things, right? The democratization of the means of violence, right? Information is available, uh, and so I, I think it's really preventing the attacks that can really hamper us. Um, we've been pretty successful about doing that, but it, it's definitely hard hard to prevent. And, and when you, you know, even 15 years ago, we were arguing, right, that everything was Al Qaeda, right? Because there's advantages to be called Al Qaeda, right? You get the brand recognition, and then it was ISIS after that, right? Brand affiliation, because you're, you're not really anybody if you're the global Salafists were preaching in combat, the media is not going to cover you because they, no one cares to read about GSPC, but you put Al Qaeda in front of the name, uh, then, then it's, it's relevant. And then same thing from a, from a policy perspective, Right? We have certain tools, as long as we can tie them to Al Qaeda or something, then we can lump them in there. So everybody's incentivized actually to, to lump them in as Al Qaeda or Islamic State, whether it's you know, media to report on them or, or gives us uh, policy tools. Um, and, and so it actually makes it harder to kind of understand the difference, differences within the broad Al Qaeda, the broader Islamic State or whatever the next iteration is. Elizabeth, you wanna add anything to that? Uh, I will just add one. I will just add one thing. You probably saw me nodding away because I was agreeing so much with what Liam was saying. But um, just one thing that he reminded me of, that Liam reminded me of, was uh, on some interviews. In some interviews I was doing uh, on the ground in in Yemen uh, just before the pandemic, I remember some of the locals telling me that there are groups along the coast in a place called Shabwa who were claiming to be Al-Qaeda, um, not because they wanted Western media attention, although, but because they could claim a higher price on the ground for becoming guns for hire for other militias actors in the war. If they claimed that they were Al-Qaeda, they, they'd get more money than if they were just some regular gang. So you can see how the waters are muddied in so many different ways. Let's turn to some of the questions. Um, here's one. Does the panel find disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration promotion programs for ex-combatants to be effective? And I guess the question underlying that is, you know, if you, you carve out some space for de-radicalization of ex-combatants, is this something that works? And if so, how does that work? Anybody want to take that on? Luke? afraid to call me for that one. I mean, look, there's a pretty, pretty rich body of research that I, uh, I cannot speak about in any great depth um, around DDR programs and what works and what doesn't work. And we have, you know, tons of experience on this from a whole range of different conflicts, some of which are more or less applicable to a, a terrorist environment. Um, maybe Elizabeth or anybody else with a more academic background can speak to some of that. It is essential, right? And um, and I think things like DDR, things like counter and violent extremism, have been the really underinvested tools um, throughout the war on terror. And uh, and what worries me a lot about that is, what are we going to do in a place like Yemen, where eventually the fighting will stop with the Houthis, or we presume at some point the civil war will end, and you will have a lot of people who. Um, you know, a lot of disgruntled young, uh, young men who, uh, who decided to fight the Houthis who may be drawn to terrorist groups um, after that. Um, I think there's a lot of case to be made that um, the, the decrease in Al Qaeda activity um, in Yemen has, is a direct response of sort of fighters being diverted to the anti-Houthi cause instead. Um, if you look at a, a place like Somalia, you're going to have similar types of challenges.
challenges um, if we ever get to a point of some level of reconciliation um, or the such with uh, with Al Shabaab. And there's some programs that they've stood up in in um, in Somalia that have had kind of limited and um, limited success, but uh, but at least some early ideas of how we might do that. You know, we need to, we need a lot more to figure out how those programs um, can work effectively in these contexts, and then to appropriately fund them, um, and then to develop some metrics for what actually works or not. I think one of the things that's really frustrating when I worked in the Obama administration on our preventing violent extremism efforts is we just had so little metrics, so few metrics on which which of these programs actually worked um, and which of them would actually uh, achieve the goal of, of sort of undermining the, the jihadist cause. But that's a, a perhaps uh, unsatisfactory answer. Not unsatisfactory at all. Um, Peter, I want to ask you something that sort of flips that a little bit, which is that Luke referred to, you know, of course, the war in Yemen will end. But one of the things that's happening is this persistent, you know, conflict on the ground throughout the region, not just Yemen, which you've been writing about and detailing and observing. And now I'm kind of wondering, as the shift of the globe turns to other things, whether it's global issues, whether it's Russia and Ukraine, whether it's China, you know, to big power rivalries, how do you see this affecting either our attention for Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, um, or the reality on the ground? In other words, do you have hope for some kind of stability in the region? And, and do you think that the, uh, the attention of the rest of the world, is, it's being drawn out, is gonna have an impact um, there? Well, if you're an Afghan, yes, you think, you know, the, you're very worried about the fact that the world's attention is just completely consumed with Ukraine and it's not like Afghanistan's issues have gone away. I would say the biggest change since 9-11 is sectarianism, which of course the United States had a major role in provoking. Um, you know, absent our <laughs> invasion of Iraq and uh, then the subsequent civil war, which was sectarian in nature, the sectarianism we're seeing in Yemen in Syria, in Iraq, I think that you know we we were part of the original sin there, and I think that's the biggest change. I mean, if you look at Bin Laden, Bin Laden was not looking to create some sort of <clears throat> sectarian war across the region. Uh, ISIS certainly is, and if you look at the attacks in Pakistan, just in the last two, two weeks, where they killed what, several dozen worshippers at a Shia mosque in Peshawar, and if you look at the increasing attacks on Shia and Hazaras in Afghanistan, so. This thing is sort of spreading. It's always existed, of course, and uh, but I think that's the, the the big shift that we're seeing. But I do I'm picking up on something that Liam said, and also Elizabeth and and uh, and Luke. I mean, uh, if we were to go back and do this all over again, <laughs> the war on terror, I would say you know there was a debate in the Pentagon during the Obama administration about what to do in Afghanistan, and there was a part of uh, the debate was go light and go long. Now. The people proposing that didn't win the debate. One of them was Joe Biden. Um, and, and he's made, I think, a big mistake by just pulling the plug entirely. Uh, but it, going light and go long would have had several, uh, I think, very effective for all the reasons that Elizabeth and, and, and Liam and Luke have already sort of alluded to. It would also be very politically sustainable in the United States because it wouldn't have cost a huge amount of money. Um, and it would be politically sustainable in the countries that basically wanted us to be there, like Afghanistan and Iraq. And we still have 2,500 soldiers in Iraq that we've relabeled non-combatant uh, uh, soldiers. And, and that really is just to sort of satisfy the Shia political parties. And it seems to be good enough for the moment. Um, and we could have done that in Afghanistan. There's all sorts of things. We could have, if we'd left one Marine outside the U.S. Embassy and said that Marine is going to be there, indefinitely. That's what the, Af the Afghans could care less, whether we had 3,500 troops or 8,400 as we had at the end of Obama or whatever. What they wanted to hear is that we were planning to be there, uh, you know, for the long term. And saying that would have cost us absolutely nothing, uh, would have been in our interest, their interests, uh, the NATO, uh, you know, when we said we were leaving, everybody else left and the contractors left. And that was very important because there were 6,000 American contractors keeping the Afghan Air Force, uh, you know, up in the air. Uh, so anyway, I think if if there was a big lesson, <laughs> at least I take away from this discussion, is that going light and going long would have been politically sustainable. And, and uh, you know, obviously it wouldn't be the, there's no perfect solution. It would have been the least bad solution that's been proposed. Before we get to Ukraine, which I, I know we want to do, um, I want to just raise something that's along the lines of what Elizabeth introduced, which is these new kind of weapons that are being referred to as, you know, 
weapons of, of warfare that are hybrid weapons, you know, among them, uh, cryptocurrency and social media. And I just want to focus on the social media for a moment and just ask you all, and I know Elizabeth has spoken on this, but I'm curious of, of all of you thinking, you know, what are the uh, ability, do you think, to really counter the social media um, that's kind of social media war and how it affects what we know, how we react. Is this something that you have confidence we're gonna get on top of or is it something you think is going to um, um, linger? Um, Cause I noticed that, um, that a vice prime minister of Ukraine today was reported as you know, pronouncing that social media was a modern weapon of war with his intention to use it that way. Is that what we want? Is we want it to, to on both sides or is this a way of calming this down? I mean, how do you see this social media component? And Elizabeth, we should probably start with you so you could pick up from your comments from before and then we'll go around. Yeah, that is a, that is a very difficult question. Um, but yes, there's no question that social media is immensely influential. And um, since we've managed to knock so many of the platforms off, um, I mean, knock them offline, um, so I'm thinking, was it no, November 20, November 2018, I think, a lot, uh, Europol and Interpol did quite a lot with Telegram, because um, I, I follow, I, I follow Al-Qaeda and, uh, well, and some of the Islamic State uh, groups in real time, um, every, all day, every day, and sometimes in the middle of the night as well, so I'm constantly looking at, looking at what they're putting out. And it has become much more difficult to find them. Um, and we've, we're now in, in much smaller spaces where you have to really be looking for them in order to be able to find them. So what I've always thought we've done very badly is the counter messaging. Uh, so, you know, we haven't been too bad at knocking them, knocking them offline, closing their platforms down. And, and, and I think that when someone's had their platform closed down for the 15th, 20th time, it no longer feels like the badge of honor it did the first or second time, it starts to feel quite painful and annoying um, and probably quite demoralizing. Why on earth we don't seem able to counter message effectively? Uh, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is we're doing it ourselves instead of collecting authentic voices and um, perhaps helping to magnify them. Uh, I don't think it works when you're putting out messages as as a government or as a, a contractor that's very obviously linked to the government. And uh, and also undermining, I mean, I think there are a lot of lessons one can learn from how Al-Qaeda tried to undermine Islamic State, the kinds of derogatory terms they used, the kinds of um, exposés they did, a lot of humour which was very undermining. I think, I think we could be watching the groups themselves to also learn a little bit on how to undermine well. Um, the one final point I'd make is that on the ground, I noticed, um, sorry, this is, this is in Yemen again, but I noticed that so many more people are using um, social media, obviously, than there were at the beginning of the war seven years ago, but also that they're not necessarily professionally on things like Twitter or even Telegram, but news travels by like wildfire in WhatsApp groups and they're much more trusted. Um, I, 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 now, I don't know if that's just my microcosmic experience, but, but my sense is, you know, my sense is that that's quite widespread. Um, and that's, that's a much more popular platform. I'll stop there. Luke, I'd like to bring you in here because in your writing about various policies and you're writing about, in particular, the, the promise of diplomacy, you know, to what extent is the exchanges that are going on, you know, um, non-officially <laughs> messing things up in terms of how we address things? How do you see, or, or do you really think that's a separate thing, social media, or is it really something that interferes and that maybe we could counter in several ways, both hard and soft ways? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think it was really uh, highlighted a lot of the key challenges and how we think about social media. And, you know, one of the one of the things I had the fortune to work on in government was um, establishing what's now the Global Engagement Center, uh, which we had stood up um, and kind of reinvented a former iteration of it. And one of the insights that we achieved, and this is a really awesome process, we brought in these experts on messaging and technology and spread of information from mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, from, um, from Madison Avenue, kind of across this kind of cross the society type effort that I think we all sort of aspire to. And one of the things we really found was that you can't, you can't put out U.S. messaging, right? U.S. messaging is just inherently not cool. It's not going to resonate. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, how slick you make it look. You have to identify and you have to amplify um, credible voices that oppose those who you want to counter. Um, and sometimes those might be voices that you do not fully embrace, that those might be some anti-American voices, in fact. They're anti-American, but they're not pro-violence, right? And so it's this tricky dance of identifying that range of voices out there um, where they need assistance with, you know, improving their production quality or amplifying um, their efforts, um, being able to, to lean into that and, and to be able to, to help them with that and giving yourself some of the, um, the political runway, which I think is really important in this space. Um, to be able to work with groups that, you know, on their face might be the sort of thing that a, you know, a Marco Rubio or a Ted Cruz would seize on as being the, not the kind of group we want to work with. Again, it's not about this, having a full close partnership with this group or with this particular voice. It's about identifying credible voices that can ultimately undermine uh, those of your adversary. Um, and uh, and I think we put that, that a really great system in place for that. You know, it's always challenging because this is, gets you really deep into the kind of the risk aversion of the bureaucracy and the unwillingness to really engage in this kind of provocative space you know you don't you don't typically I work at a media company now right we don't we don't operate by committee we don't have a long interagency uh, coordination process you have to be nimble you have to be agile and I sometimes fear government's not um, up to that task I also think though and I think this we saw this certainly at the beginning of the ISIS challenge and when ISIS first kind of really went on, online and they got a ton of attention for that and I think we're also seeing it now is a broad outpouring of desire from across society to be helpful right and like I said we built this really great effort that involved Madison Avenue involved Silicon Valley it involved Hollywood um, and uh, and it just sort of languished and then died at the beginning of the Trump administration because so many of the centers were so opposed to President Trump but I think there's a real desire to help and I think there's a real opportunity for the administration um, both on counterterrorism, but even now on, on Ukraine and, and Russia issues um, to build a really effective partnership with those outside of government who can help with these tricky messaging solutions. Interesting. Liam, that kind of, he teed it up for you to talk about Ukraine. Um, you were in Ukraine from 2016 to 2018, working with General Abizade. Um, can you bring this conversation around to what's happening in Ukraine and, and the um, sort of questions it pushes puts before the American uh, security establishment and the world and just how you see this. I mean, particularly in terms of what you said before, your distinction between, you know, an appetite for long-term risk or short-term risk and how you, how you see this in the current conflict. Yeah, first, to answer your last questions about countering violent extremism online and social media recruitment, chapters 29 and 30 in the book. So it's available online. So go ahead and mm -hmm. for the listeners, they can, go, they can get a longer uh, explanation of that. Uh, but yes, uh, turning towards uh, Ukraine, I mean, first of all, right, we talk about, again, short-term risk aversion. I, I seriously doubt we have any advisors there, uh, not advisors, observers, right? I mean, we used to put observers in wars all the time, right, on both sides when we can. Obviously, we're not going to get them on Russia's side to really understand how is war emerging, right? We didn't do it in, in, in 2020 in, in, the, in the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war. We should have done this, right? And that's how we get a sense of where warfare is going by being there as opposed to observing it after the fact. Uh, so that's something where we could take more of a risk to really understand what's going on on the ground better from, you know, from what, what direction it's going to go. Um, in, in terms of the war and how it's playing out, yeah, I mean, I think we're all a little bit shocked on, the, on, on Russia's kind of initial strategy, uh, especially after executing the, you know, the seizure of Crimea to perfection obviously a massive underperformance by, by them so far, but um, going back, you know, chiming in a little bit of building the force. I mean, Ukraine, we were over there, they were committed to building a competent military in, in their president, it was President Poroshenko at the time and their minister of defense and chief of defense uh, at the time, 
they were not worried about the fight in the Donbass, right? The, the low level conflict that was going on in the East. They were deathly afraid of a Russian invasion, which is what happened. And they were incentivized to reform their military to defend as well as possible against that. And, and that was with their concern every day. And so that's really what they were trying to build and what, their, what our advice to them was for. Um, and a number of advisory efforts from different nations. But again, sometimes at that time, different people within different nations we're trying to too much mirror image, right? Our model, but just figuring out what what does the Ukrainian model for the military need to be like? Um, so pause there. Yeah, Peter, I'm curious your thoughts here as somebody who's watched so many U.S. engagements abroad um, go go awry. <laughs> um, so many you know, global counter terrorism, counter you know uh, violence initiatives go forward. Where does, what does Ukraine look like to you? Do you see this as something that's going to evolve into a, a long war? Or do you see this something as more of an, yet another region that will be in disarray for X amount of years in which we try to nip, nip and tuck at the edges? And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but is this look like what we've been encountering in the past just happens to be nation state actors? Or does this really seem like a difference of magnitude, of character, um, et cetera? Well, on the social media point that we just discussed, it's amazing how incompetent the Russians have been, who have been long <clears throat> trumpeted as masters of hybrid warfare. And yet Zelensky is doing daily press conferences and social media appearances, and they haven't shut down anything, it seems. Uh, so what, what, what do the Ukrainians learn from the Crimea experience where the Russians did deploy effective cyber warfare? It seems that they have. And then, you know, Machiavelli observed uh, half a millennia ago that um, wars begin when, when you will, but they do not end when you please. And so, you know, we don't know, uh, Yogi, Berra, Yogi Berra also said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, and so we just don't know. But I mean, the most likely outcome is what we're seeing now, which is a, 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 a quagmire that goes on for, a, you know, a year and is a slow bleeding ulcer on the Russian, <laughs> Russian body politic uh, with all sorts of uncertain consequences. Um, so, I mean, to me, that's, you know, and then of course there is the possibility of peace, uh, which will satisfy no one, but, uh, you know, the peace arrives when there's a mutually hurting stalemate, which there may be now. Uh, then there's the possibility of the Ukrainians win, unlikely perhaps, but they could push back. Uh, and then there's the possibility that Putin is removed. I mean, these are all so, but possibility number one is the most likely. Uh, but there, there are various futures that could happen. Luke, I want to end with a question that for you, which sort of follows on what Peter said, which is that um, President Biden and uh, Tony Blinken have ratcheted up the diplomatic effort um, even prior to this in terms of restoring much of what had been weakened in recent years. Um, what do you see the chances of diplomacy having an impact? A, a, a resolving impact in um, Ukraine, given what you know about the strengths of today's State Department. And I know that's kind of a predictive question, but but how robust are we right now, and 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 how confident are they they might be able to do that? I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough one. I, mean, I apologize. I'd love to requote the, uh, the the Yogi Berra quote that uh, Peter Bergen just used. I mean, look, I think this administration has has prioritized diplomacy, has prioritized maintaining the liberal world order. Um, there's no no doubt that their uh, their playbook for how they're dealing with this um, and their approach to it so far um, has been kind of right out of that that idea of of lead with diplomacy, lead with alliances, build international consensus before you do it, which is. Sort of all the more striking how Afghanistan went so poorly, right? Is sort of like they didn't seem to fully embrace that that playbook and in, in the um, in the execution of the of the drawdown, um, which was a policy I supported, but the the actual um, implementation of it was just awful. So so clearly there's a a, a um, clearly there's a, uh, a, a the intention is the right place, um, the focus is in the right place, um, but can they actually do it? You know, I think a lot of that depends on do we have the right ambassadors in place and other diplomats to be able to uh, to actually execute on this plan. Um, do we actually have still the credibility with some of our um, allies that has been strained over the last couple of years, both in the Trump administration when they undermined things and and in many cases over disputes over how we've waged a war on terror. So, you know, anyway, so I think that we're going to be 
in a position where great power com conflict, looking at Russia, China, et cetera, is going to be more important going forward. Counterterrorism is going to get squeezed, and it's going to be all the more important that we have robust diplomatic approaches, light footprint approaches, and frankly, that we're willing to accept some risk and we're willing to rely on some of the really great defensive capabilities that are outlined in the, in the, uh, the textbook um, to keep us safe. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's... Um... I think we've gone a long way to understanding how, you know, when they write the history books, it's what happened before. And this is something that you point out in your essays, you know, um, it's what happened before that infects or infuses how we act in the present. And so in the long term, how the war on terror affects how all of us confront this new instability and this new war front. It, it, it's important and I just thank you so much for, for reminding us of what it is we're bringing to the table, both in terms of our regrets and our hopes for you know, what, we've, what we've fixed and what we, whoever we are, think we know um, how to do. So um, we're out of time. Let me just say that I know Mike would have loved this. Um, I know he'd be so proud of this book. So thank you all and we'll see you next time. Bye.